Hi, uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm Milda, and this is a joint work with my colleague from Denmark, uh, Martin Marip. Uh, okay, so you probably heard in the news. So sadly, we're in this situation since uh, March 11 last year. Uh, we have this uh, uh, disaster in Fukushima, and sadly, radiation is a concern of everyone living in Japan on like ordinary people being concerned about radiation. And we actually do have data like this. Uh, this is a radi radiation dose rate measured in a micro sievert per hour. Uh, but this is obviously not enough because uh, there are different radionuclides that have different health concerns. Uh, so this measured radiation dose is a mixture of everything. And for example, iodine-131, which was the source of major concern in the beginning, that concentrates in the thyroid, and that's the cause of thyroid cancer. And strontium-19 concentrates in the bone because it resembles calcium, so it causes another type of calcium. So we would like to see these different radionuclides separately, uh, although the data is uh, a mixture of everything. So uh, there are uh, uh, instruments that can distinguish different types of nuclides. For example, you can do in situ gamma ray spectrometry, but this is a rather expensive equipment that needs to be transported, which is kind of big. So this has a good nuclide uh, resolution, but it's difficult to transport, and it's difficult to do this measurement uh, everywhere, especially densely. So on the other hand, if you want spatial density, you can do aerial uh, radiation monitoring with, for example, with a helicopter. But again, you cannot distinguish different types of radionuclides. And also, because you cannot keep this uh, helicopter flying around every day, it's, you cannot get a high tensor, temporal resolution. So what we want to address in this paper is we want to do something in the middle uh, where Aerial monitoring gives good spatial resolution, but you cannot distinguish different types of radionuclides at all. On the other hand, if you do gamma ray spectrometry, you get poor spatial resolution, at the, but you get a good, uh, you can distinguish different types of nuclides. So what we want to do first is to do, use machine learning to infer what's in the data, what's, uh, what type of radionuclides are in the data, to which extent, at which location. And also we would like to combine uh, data sets coming from different sources because in the beginning of the disaster, different institutions started to release uh, data sets from like measuring different places in all over Japan. So uh, the next question is why we do Bayesian. So apart from my colleague Martin being Bayesian, the reason is by threefold. So first of all, if you look at the, the raw data set, this, uh, the one released from the Tokyo Electronic Power Company, it's massively missing. So without a strong generative model, generative assumption, you have no chance of getting anything in between. So obviously, so these are different locations, and obviously they um, ran around with a car, uh, with a Geiger counter. Uh, so when you have measurements here, there is no measurement there, and when you have measurements here, there is no measurement there. So obviously, we need a strong generative model. And also, uh, we don't know the amount of uncertainty in the data, so we also want to infer the uncertainty, w which is uh, what Bayesian methods are good at. And also we have a lot of parameters and hyperparameters in this model if we use some kind of generative model. So we don't want to optimize them, instead we want to average them out. So our basic assumption of our generative model can be stated as follows. So uh, there are distinct time points, which we call events, and from those vents are where something is released into the environment. So I don't know how much of which type, but something is released into the environment. And all of these different things called nuclei, they start decaying at some different decay rate called half-life. Half so different radionuclides have different half-lives, which we also want to infer. And what we measure is this observed in the light, light blue curve is a mixture of everything. So there are these distinct uh, time points we call event, and there are different types of nuclei. And so, uh, so we also assume that this have an exponential decay curve, which is known from physics, and we, also, we want to infer which type of nuclei are in which location. But actually, in this talk, we uh, assume that the events are known a priori. So um, more mathematically, 
this is the average dose rate at the teeth measurement time at the ELF location is a mixture of different events, E, so we assume that there are E events, and C nuclei. So there are C nuclei. And each term is a kind of exponential uh, decay function, which has an onset at the event time, and decays exponentially with an un unknown decay constant lambda C, which only depends on the type of nuclide C. And here are two coefficients, which we assume a kind of factor analytic decomposition, where the nuclide concentration matrix uh, A denotes the amount of C, the C type of nuclide in the E event. So this coefficient is ACE. And uh, based on this, we assume a kind of spatial homogeneity. So this is constant over all locations. And so this, uh, the same relative proportion of, so it's a kind of cocktail of new radionuclides, and this cocktail is in the same proportion, and it's distributed in different locations at the same uh, relative concentration, but different amounts in different spatial locations, L. Um, yeah, so uh, if you write the gener generative model, uh, it, it, can be seen, uh, it can be drawn like this. So uh, on top of this, uh, locations, we have a region that spans all over Japan. So in, it, in each region, we assume that several locations and where this spatial homogeneity assumption holds. So outside a region, spatial homogeneity doesn't hold, but inside a region, spatial homogeneity holds. So in each region, we have several locations, and for several locations, these locations, we have T measurements, and for each measurement, we have the time and the radioactivity dose weight measurements and the, the time of the event. And these are coming from the A coefficient and B coefficient and the prior variance, the noise variance of the measurement. And because we don't know the, these guys and we also want to infer how many uh, radionuclides are in the environment. So although this is a parametric approach, we, fix, we have to fix the number of uh, radionuclides we want to infer how many there are in the automatic relevance determination framework. So we also infer the prior variance of these coefficients, which have hyperparameters alpha and beta. And also this lambda is the decay constant, which we also want to infer. So, um, okay, so to summarize, we have uh, a Bayesian uh, recipe for generating a Fukushima disaster. So um, basically, uh, we you first draw a, a nuclide decay constant, and you also draw the prior variance of, of A coefficient and B coefficient from inverse uh, gamma distribution. And you, because A and B coefficients are non-negative, they are sampled from uh, truncated positive part Gaussian distribution, so, and, and so on. And for inference, we do Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, which is basically a Gibbs algorithm, but also we have to do metropolis hasting for the, the decay constant. And for sampling over these uh, positive part Gaussian distribution, we use the site sampling uh, technique uh, proposed in this paper. So uh, switching gear a little bit, um, we also want to talk about some mathematical property of the model. So uh, first of all, we ask whether this model is identifiable, which in the meaning that it's mapping between the parameter and the model one-to-one. -one. And obviously, there are different nuclei. You can permute the order of the, the mixture coefficient, mi mixture components, so this is not one-to-one. -one. And also, you can multiply something to A and divide something by B. So there is also a trivial undeterminate indeterminacy. But actually, what we can tell is that if you disregard this trivial indeterminacy, uh, this model is identifiable if you have the sufficient number of samples. So if E, e is the number of events, and C is the number of nuclei, and T is the number of total number of measurements in this one, one region R. So if you have sufficient number of measurements, uh, this model, model becomes identifiable, which you, you can get from a simple uh, number of parameters calculation. And also another point I want to discuss is that, <coughs> so one column of A is the relative concentration of different types of radionuclides. So the question is, does this reflect in the initial amount of radionuclides uh, released into the environment? And actually, this is no, because 
some isotopes turn into another unstable isotopes, and then they turn into another unstable isotopes, and so on. So you have to take the decay chain into co consideration. Otherwise, this is just a kind of effective uh, relative uh, concentration. But if you actually, if you know the, the decay chain, you can like uh, go back and and infer the, the actual initial concentration uh, that was released into the environment. So uh, this was some mathematical properties and I go into synthetic experiment. So this is a synthetic data we generated from our Bayesian recipe. And uh, so here are some results from the synthetic experiment. So we um, put three uh, radionuclides which having decay constants here and here and here. And actually this is the number of iterations. And you can see that as the iteration uh, proceeds, there are three prominent radionuclides picked up by the model. Although we assume 10, 10 components in this model, the automatic relevance determination automatically figure out these two, three are supported from the data. So actually the, the area around each curve is the support, how much the data supports the, the each component. So all other uh, components are fluctuating around here, but they're not supported by the, the data at all. So only these three components are supported, and they seem to really uh, go to the, the true um, uh, half-life, which is like uh, less, less than one day, and this is like 10 days. So all decay constants are estimated well in this experiment. So we can also do missing data completion. So this data is completed from only 10% of the observation. There are ten, uh, five locations. Uh, and you can see on the right that uh, even with around 20% of the observation, you can reduce the relative reconstruction error we define here lower than 5%. So this is pretty good. And let's go on to uh, Fukushima data set. So the original data set is released from the Tokyo Electronic Power Company, and we analyzed the one month period following the earthquake uh, of uh, March 11. But this data set is re actually released in PDF format, and there has been uh, a community effort going on putting these numbers into Google spreadsheet on the internet. So, so this is the place you can go and if you are interested in the data. So uh, I did some pre-processing, removing some locations with very little sample. And so at the end, I got nine locations and one region. So I'm, in this case, I'm only analyzing the area around the nuclear plant with nine locations in the map. Uh, so I assume uh, spatial homogene homogeneity here. So, uh, so here is the missing data completion result. So maybe if you remember the original plot in the, the first slide, you can see that many places that had almost no data are completed by our Bayesian inference algorithm. And you can see, because of the spatial homogeneity assumption, if you see a peak here, the model thinks that there should be also something happening here. And also like here, even the, if you only see the tail of something, because we assume this uh, exponential decay curve, the model thinks that there should be a peak here. So that's how the model could infer what was not in the data. Also, we have some results. So probably this is very difficult to see. But so this is a similar plot showing the half-life of different uh, nuclei we assume in the data. And this is the number of uh, Gibbs iteration. And you can see that there are three major components supported by the data, or other components are just fluctuating around. And uh, so there are two uh, components that have a very fast decay, which was actually, you can already see it here from the, the data that these guys decay really quickly, less than a day, less than a, a day. And this guy has a decay constant uh, half-life between five days and 10 days, where, and we can kind of guess that this is iodine-131, which has decay half-life eight days. So uh, finally, I'm going to show uh, a joint analysis of two data sets. So, uh, Fukushima, so the Fukushima Daiichi data set is concentrated around the area, uh, around the nuclear plant. And the MEX data set released from the Ministry of Education and Science has a measurement all over Japan, so it's more global. So 
we would like to see what we, we can see from combining these two data sets. So there are 48 regions in total. Most of the regions contain only one location, but the, the, the last uh, region contains the Fukushima area that has uh, nine, nine locations. So, um, so here is a plot of uh, Utsunomiya city, which is not, far, not so far from the Fukushima plant, so which has a relatively high um, radiation dose rate. And you also see, uh, this is Tokyo. So this is Tokyo is a little bit more far away from the nuclear plant. And you can see there are several peaks. So the events are um, actually, so okay, so maybe I should comment how the events are detected. So I don't, uh, so events, detecting events was not part of the Bayesian inference. So I just use a simple heuristic to locate where the events are. So it detected events uh, here. So it's different from the events detected for the Utsunomiya city. And here there are two events that probably correspond to a rainfall in this uh, 21st of March and 23rd of March. So to, to summarize, um, we have proposed a generative model uh, and a Bayesian inference algorithms for uh, inferring the, the model. And it can identify different types of radionuclides. Uh, uh, so we have checked this uh, on the synthetic data. And also we have done some mathematical analysis to support this uh, uh, observation. And so you can consider this as a cheap alternative to spectral metry. You can just look at the Geiger count data. And Fukushima Daiichi data set, we have identified a, a nuclide that has roughly eight days of uh, half-life, which, which could correspond to uh, iodine 131, and two uh, components with very short decay. So I don't know, this, these are not the kind of nuclides they talk about in news media, but they could be something only happening in the nuclear plant. And we actually need more investigation into the joint analysis. For example, if we want to look at the global uh, data, then we definitely need a spatial smoothing uh, in, in the model. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. I imagine only very few half-lives are actually possible given the physics that underpin the whole structure. Yes, that's a very good point. Uh, in the beginning, we were trying to do something like that, assuming knowing we know the half-life of the things. But actually, it turned out that we don't know so well. So, I mean, if you look at Wikipedia for different types of isotopes, there are like too many, too many isotopes. And of, of course, maybe if you're a phys phys physician, then you probably know which type could be released from the nuclear plant. But we were also interested in seeing something that people didn't expect. So if you assume something that there should only be iodine or strontium or something like that, you probably only see what you expect in the data. But we were also interested in uh, finding out something that we didn't expect in the data. That's the reason. So, if you, uh, so you said there were, there were two kinds of measurements. The first was gamma ray spectroscopy and the other one was like Geiger counter measure. So yes. those are going to be measuring different kinds of radiation from different kinds of sources. So like the, the gamma ray one is going to be detecting gamma rays obviously, but the Geiger counter will pick up um, beta radiation over a certain distance. So it, like the source is telling you different things about the data and I don't know if you're modeling that or not. So the, the Geiger counters are actually mostly picking up gamma rays. And so in that respect, it's uh, the same. But of course, if you want to combine data source from different sources, you have to be careful what they're measuring. And um, yeah, so like after the earthquake, many people bought a small uh, Geiger counter and they actually use it wrongly. They, they use it too close to the ground. Then they will also pick up beta, beta rays. So that's like how you should, like you have to be careful where the data comes from. Our radiation data are frequently not precise numbers, but more or less fuzzy. Is it possible to integrate fuzzy data and fuzzy prior information in the model also? Uh, fuzzy in which way are you talking about? Uh, the, 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 the data are not given as numbers. Yes, so there are uncertainty. But the fuzziness, is it possible to include this? 
yes, we, uh, so we actually incorporate the uncertainty by a Gaussian likelihood, but probably you would say that a Gaussian likelihood is not the likelihood, right likelihood for uh, account data. So we, you probably you should use a Poisson likelihood, but it was a sort of a trade-off between computation and, and, and uh, the rightness of the, data, uh, of the model. I think also there's a different kind of uncertainty, which is called imprecision or fuzziness. It's not just variability in the, in the variances, and is it possible to include this in the model? Uh, uh, so if you, uh, so we, if we can agree what kind of uncertainty we're talking about, we can incorporate in the model. Okay. I've got a very quick question uh, about interactions. Yes. How important is in the debate model interactions, uh, special interactions between neighboring regions? How easy will it be? Uh, so I, so maybe I'll say it not interaction, but there will be. A dynamics of like uh, well, can, yes. air going on, uh, water going around. So there are a lot of spatial dynamics, and that was the reason that we were a little bit scared of going into the spatial interpolation part. But because we don't think that just putting a Gaussian RBF kernel would do, but you have to really take into account the weather pattern and the wind pattern and everything. But fortunately, those data are also available. You can access the wind pattern data. So that's probably another direction we can go. So in principle it is yes. More questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again.